Well, we haven't seen you in a little bit. Like, uh, yeah. you, you've been low-key doing some videos, make, you know, making some moves. Fill us in on what's been going down. Yeah, so uh, I released three singles this year. One of them I just uh, released on the 28th, set fire to it, and before that, Poison Clan, and before that, uh, Rap Assassin at the beginning of the year. And, yeah, just been doing shows. Actually, this was... I kind of came back to Vancouver after living overseas in Asia. Nice. I came back uh, January 1st of two years ago. So, or sorry, last year actually. Mm. So it's been about like a year and a bit since I've been like seriously pursuing trying to be active in hip hop music in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, so I started doing shows this year, did about six or seven shows and just filmed a music video uh, a few days ago with DJ 151. Nice. So that's going to be released next month. And uh, yeah, just been really focusing on trying to get my name out there and making more music. Yeah, for shout outs to DJ One Fifty One with his Feast and Famine show mm -hmm. Monday. Yeah, I've been on there a couple times too, and uh, he's a really nice guy, and he really supports the local scene. For real, and he's also like ridiculous at at, at scratching and just yeah. DJing in general. Like he's just such a veteran, been doing it for so long, mm. and uh, it's just so intuitive to him that it, it's it's amazing to watch him. Yeah, oh, wow, well, that's amazing that you're getting down on a video with him and doing you know doing yeah. big things. <laughs> yeah, no, when it's it's a remix actually, mm. um, and. Uh, I, I came up with the concept and I just imagined like who, I want a DJ on it because I remixed um, Learn Truth by Ari the Rugged Band featuring Talib Kweli and there's like a record scratching segment on it Okay. and so I wanted another DJ to do their own kind of record scratching mm. over the track so I just saw a DJ 151 and I messaged him and, and sent him like a rough cut of the track mm. uh, and he said yeah let's do it so I was very happy because I wasn't sure that it was going to happen you know mm -hmm. um but he, he was stoked on it, and uh, yeah, I, I thought it was a great video. That like, uh, We got a really great director, Brent McDonald, who took all the footage and took it at some like iconic locations in Vancouver, like the art gallery, oh, yeah. and that alley by the Red Room with all that dope graffiti. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so, and then we did like a, a rehearsal space for DJ 151 scene, so it's got a lot of different cool scenes that kind of, I think, capture some aspects of Vancouver as a city, so I'm pretty pumped on it. That's hype. And, and Daybreak, for the people who are just learning about you, tell us how you got your name, you know, Daybreak. Um, so my real name is Jesse Day. Mm. So I just decided like Daybreak's kind of like a new dawn, a new beginning. And I actually used to be into hip hop music back in the day in Vancouver before I moved over to Asia to, to Seoul City in South Korea, where I basically hosted TV shows. I did some music because I learned to rap in Korean while I was there. Wow. And so I got some chances to appear on television programs rapping in Korean. Um, but I wasn't pursuing music really at all 100%, just a show here or there. Uh, so I was doing that and I decided I want to come back. I want to really focus on hip hop music because you know, I'm in my 30s now. I want to make a run for it. If I'm going to do it, it's kind of I feel like it's now or never. So I really want to just focus all of my life's efforts on um, trying to be successful in hip hop music. So I thought I should come back to kind of where I'm from and that there was a power in that and that I could kind of use that as a base to to then spread. But at the moment, I'm just really focused on Vancouver. Nice. And that, yeah, and Vancouver, you know, I feel like Vancouver is a good good launching pad, too, from yeah. coming from where, you know, the the Asian area that you were, you yeah, know, because right. <laughs> it's such a different de demographic, right? Like, but still, Vancouver's got a, a huge a Asian population. Yeah, actually. absolutely. And so basically, I just <clears throat> figured, like, coming back to Canada and kind of starting again, I used to call myself Exile back in the day and uh, so I kind of wanted a new beginning a different rap name and I just thought Daybreak fit because it's my actual name and then also it kind of represents a new dawning okay yeah <laughs> Daybreak I like that I like that I like thanks that. now so who are some of your biggest influences in terms of MCs that have made what you, you know you pick up at pick up the mic and influence your your kind of style yeah in the well just at the early days getting into hip-hop in general it was definitely beastie boys mm. um and run dmc and public enemy that i really listened to the most growing up but in terms of of people who influenced like me the most definitely vinnie paz from jedi mind tricks okay is probably number one for me and method men from wu-tang clan is number two and um nas and exhibit um and i'm kind of constantly trying to listen to both new hip hop and old hip hop that I hadn't heard yet, you know, because okay. there's such a bad catalog of amazing right. stuff um, that, that there's there to get into. So I'm also exploring some of the old school classic stuff that I haven't heard before and kind of getting into some of those artists and also trying to listen to new artists. So I'm kind of always trying to get some sort of influence from, you know, the, the artists that I'm really digging. Wow. Oh, and I was curious too, you were talking, 
<clears throat> excuse me, you're talking about um, shows in Vancouver. Where, 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 what are some of your favorite venues to perform at? So, so far, I've performed. My last show was at the Portside Pub. Oh, okay, I, nice. I like that venue a lot. Railway Stage and yeah. Beer Cafe as well. Really nice. Um, I performed at UBC at the Pit Pub mm. a couple times, but I think. The port side is a really awesome sound system, so Definitely. I think I like performing there the best because of that. Yeah, and a cool crowd too. Like they, they're really, like it's it's really hospitable, you know. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, I like yeah. That. The the local Spot. scene in general is pretty mm. like. I, I think I was talking about this last time I was on the show with uh, Red Shirt Mike and Deshaun. Uh, it's really not like confrontational. There's not all these MCs standing around in a room going, "Oh, that's my competition." It's oh, more like. Right. We put on a show, we have beers, and we kind of, you know, talk to each other about what we like to put each other's set. And it's just kind of like, you know, <laughs> hang out and give each other props and have some beers. So it's a pretty, um, you know, like supportive community, I feel. And so it's dope that I, I got to work with DJ 151 because, yeah, th- he's definitely a big part of that scene. And he brings a lot of different MCs together as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd say the scene here is very, very dope. Amazing, amazing. Now, so what... When you were a kid, what inspired you, to, you know, to to kind of gravitate to hip hop? Like, geez, I don't know, cause like I grew up listening to all sorts of music. Okay. I'm a big punk rock fan, metal fan, um, as well as hip hop. So, you know, it's so funny. What what actually got me really into music? So, the very first cassette my my parents bought me one time for my birthday. I think I must have been seven or eight years old. Mm. A Walkman with a cassette <laughs> that just kind of shows you how old I am. Right. But um. <laughs> And it was Michael Jackson, Dangerous. Wow. And so I just listened to that rec. That was the only album I had, wow. right? And, and I just headphones, yeah? Yeah, I loved it so much. So I was just listening to it constantly. Um, this was around, yeah, like elementary school. And uh, from there, they used to have this tape club. or uh, mm. It eventually became a CD thing. And then, you know, like a physical stuff isn't really so big anymore. But back then, they had that whole... I forget what it was called. Some sort of record club. And you get you know 10 CDs for 10 cents each or a penny each wow. and then you have to sign up for a year to agree to buy one album per month okay. for like the year but up front they give you just 10 albums or whatever you want so this I is that ca- school? it sounds like uh, a, re- like a no, record no no this like is a like a mail pool. order thing ah okay yeah, sounds like, yeah it sounds like a DJ pool kind of thing yeah it, it was a mail order thing and it was <laughs> all like popular music in okay. various genres and you tick these little boxes and oh, sent the card like? in the mail <laughs> nice. and then they sent you the albums or whatever wow. and then every month you had to like make your new selections so I ended up exploring a lot of different artists that way. Nice. Um, I think LL Cool J was was what I was listening to at the okay, time. Okay. Actually, that inspired me to first. I had this little Fisher Price tape recorder that my parents had bought me as well. And if you like, you know, press play and record at the same time or whatever, there's this little speaker on it. <laughs> oh. So it's obviously pretty poor quality. Um, but I kind of started to write random lyrics, and then I was rapping them. I was like playing Mama Said Knock You Out through some other player and then I was recording my voice on this one just over, you know, I didn't have an instrumental obviously right, right. at this time. Wow. And just rapping over it and, and having fun with it. And um, yeah, just music's always been a part of my life because when I went into middle school, I played bass guitar uh, and snare drum and clarinet actually in mm. the band class or whatever. And uh, from there in high school, I started a, various punk bands and then got into metal as well so I've been in a few metal bands too playing guitar um, so I've just kind of always had had music with me so I, I take inspiration from a music as an art in general I think that's tight so but hearing about those instruments too still though so did you go to like have, have band class and yeah uh, even like, private lessons and all that too? yeah in middle school throughout oh, okay. middle school and then in high school I stopped I got into, I was I, I was always very rebellious and mm. and kind of a problem in school, <laughs> um, but when I got to high school, I, I got into my punk slash metal phase and mm. just focused on guitar more than anything. And I didn't go to band class or anything. I was actually very against. Like I took guitar class, and I think I was a pretty good guitar player. And I came so close to failing simply because I would not do any assignments given to me. Okay, this week's assignment is you're learning this song by the Beatles right. or whatever. And I was Yikes. like, nah, I'm gonna play Slayer in the corner while you guys do this. Oh, and that's basically Rebel. yeah, that's basically what I did. I used to go around school playing like speed metal on an, my dad's acoustic guitar because that's all I had at the time. Um, wow. But. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really continue into my band class career in high school. I cut it off. 
<laughs> I went still, off the grid. Still, still, still. Yeah. You, you, you got some training. That's, I that's kept awesome. playing. Yeah, I kept <laughs> yeah playing. definitely. You kept, you kept it moving. Um, I, I do have, let me make, let make sure I have the right track ready. Um, oh, we were talking about the new single. Yeah. Uh, Set fire to it. Did you want to give it a little intro? Because we can fly sure. right into it. Yeah. So this is a track produced by um, an EDM producer in the Netherlands, actually, Sniker. Kid, 17 years old, and he cool. just hit me up on Instagram. I think he's a child prodigy, personally, because I've heard his other stuff that he's made, too. He normally just does, like, purely instrumental EDM stuff, but it's very different. Like, it's it's very unique. And he sent me this track and asked me if I would rap over it, and it has a very cinematic sort of feel to it, and it almost felt like uh, music from a medieval war scene. So I kind of took that Whoa. as the a first piece of inspiration and made it a little bit of like a Game of Thrones style lyrically about like a king who's exiled and then he builds up his own army while in exile and comes back and like burns everything to the ground. So it's called Set Fire to It. Here we go. 100.5 FM, Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO. You're listening to the Urban Renewal Project. So I actually came from the island today. Okay. So, cool. Yeah, I, I, I was had... there recently too. Oh, My family nice. lives there. Oh, yeah. I was born in Victoria. Uh, so. nice. Oh, yeah. I saw some from the bio. Yeah. Do, do you want to dive into the history of Victoria and stuff like that? Oh, geez. Because like, <laughs> the thing is, uh, I although I um, was born in Victoria, I left Victoria at age seven. Okay. Um, and moved to a very small village called Parksville. Wow. Which is... Uh, like north of Nanaimo by mm-hmm. like 30 minutes or something if you've heard of Nanaimo basically a very small community I think at the time population like 9,000 probably still pretty much the same uh-huh. uh, when I go back it just seems like the exact same place but uh, so I spent most of my life like my teenage years my developing years mm-hmm. um, when I was finding out who I was in Parksville <laughs> amazing so there wasn't really any sort of scene or anything to speak of there well, they it do was a like, great Canada Day celebration okay yeah and they had the Sandcastle <laughs> competition oh, as yeah, well yeah. Um, but yeah so I Basically, you know, we'd play in bands at, like, friends' houses. You know, my friend lived on a farm, and we would go... They turned, like, the barn into a jam space. What? So that was, like, my scene space. growing up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, there was a, there's a few small spots where they did, like, all-ages shows and stuff. Okay. So we used to go to those and... Uh, and check that out. But in terms of anything going on musically, it was a very small town. Mm. But still, and so, d- and did you make some trips over to Vancouver every so often, even when you were young? Uh, not really. Actually, okay. the first, I came over here after, when I decided I wanted to go to college, I went to, I guess it's a university now, but Capilano. Oh, right. So nice. uh, I went there and took acting for the camera program. And so that was kind of my introduction to really... I'd visited a few times, but hadn't been a lot. And that's kind of when I permanently moved to Vancouver before I left to go to Asia. I was here for like five years or something. Nice, nice. Uh, now, what can uh, 2019... What can we expect from you for, t- for 2019? Are there any big, big announcements you want to make? Right um, well, the, the Learn Truth Remix music video is going to be mm-hmm. dropping sometime around the middle of January. Uh, so that will be something that's going to be coming up. And then also... Uh, I've got another single, I'm not sure what it's called yet, I just got the beat, and that's going to be coming out, uh, I think, March 1st, and then sometime end of April, maybe, uh, the, the, the release date's not totally set, I want to release um, my first EP, which is called Android Dreams, and which I have uh, one track finished for already, and a few different producers are coming together on this EP, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, Charisma K is a Korean producer that I've been working with, and W- the the first song on that EP, Machine Code, was done with him. And then the Sniker, the guy who did the beat of Set Fire to It, which we just heard, is also contributing a track. And then Retro Beats in Greece, uh, who produced one of my other singles, Poison Clan, has also already given me a beat for it. So uh, it's going to be kind of these three producers, and I gave them kind of the theme. It's like a dark sci-fi sort of concept. So the, the beats kind of sound like that, like a little bit like Blade Runner or something Ooh, like yeah. that, like in that vein. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, the throwback, you know, old styles. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, actually, one of my favorite albums of all time is Janelle Monet's The Arc Android. Okay. Uh, which is also a sci-fi theme, kind of, but it, it combines like sci-fi with 1920s kind of Prohibition era sort right. of style. Um, right. So that album was kind of a, a bit of an influence to, to do something musically in like a, a sci-fi kind of cinematic direction for me. Nice. Now, have, have you set yourself any big goals too for, the, you know, to get through the year? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I would like to open for at least one like very known artist who's okay. coming through on tour. Right, right. So that's one of my goals for 2019 is to start um, doing shows where I can get in front of a bunch of people. I mean, I, I'm happy to do any show, honestly. Uh, 
and I'm all about promoting myself, so I'm happy to try to bring as many people as I can. But I would really love to get on a stage where there is a sizable audience there to see uh, a bigger artist. And most people have no idea who I am. Mm. I would love to be in that situation because I think uh, the amount that I've, the amount of work I've put in into practice and and improving my live performance has been so much now that I think I'm at that level where I can get in front of that crowd and they'll like it. So. Or at least, if, if they don't like the music, at least they'll they'll appreciate the passion and, and the technicality that goes into what right, I'm right, doing. Right. So uh, I, I really want to be put in that position. So I'm going to I'm gonna try as, as much as I can to, to make that happen. That's hype. Now, um, do, you, do you want to tell us anything about the, your personal rap style? Like, do you, do you, um, you know, identify with a certain rapper that you kind of, I don't know, sort of emulate or... Yeah, Vinny Paz a little oh, bit right, with the, saying. like, roughness of the voice and Method Man as well a little bit. Uh... I actually really concentrated when I came back uh, from Asia and started dis- and decided like I want to take this thing seriously. I really started practicing a lot in terms of just like getting into the details of the sound of my voice and and my flow and everything like that, and making small adjustments here and there to kind of uh, make my voice sound a certain way that I that I liked. So definitely, there's like a bit of a bite to it, like Vinny Paz, and then. I'd say there's a bit. I'd say there's a bit of all the MCs that that influence me in their exhibit for mm, sure as well. Right. Nice. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's a combination of those those rappers. <laughs> what a good look! I, I like that. Good good sound. Um, I also have some more music. I want to I want to run through this music so people can okay. really get a feel of what what you're what you're all about. Cool. Um, Rap assassin. Yeah. Now, do you want to, how how long has this song been out? Is this a new? This new was uh, at the beginning of the year, I think March. Okay. Of this year okay. I released it, okay. uh, and it's ba- I basically just wanted to do a song that had a really technical rap flow in it. Uh, so that kind of was almost a little bit. I don't know how to say, not obscure, but just in the way that the flow is constructed, very interesting patterns in terms of how the bars are constructed and, and how the lines go into each other and stopping, starting, pausing, and just doing something kind of technical with a, with a rap flow. So that's where I approach the idea for this track from. So here we go, 100.5 FM, Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO. You're listening to the Urban Renewal Project. Fire music, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, you bla- you're blasting them out of the water here. With Thank you. Great tunes for you know our listeners. Get some brand new music for 2019, right? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. Now, so tell us the difference between you know, um, well, you did some music in China, yeah, like performances and stuff, and in, in Vancouver, in Seoul City. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Like tell us, tell us what what the differences are. Like, what do you what do you see? Well. I did several shows in Seoul City, uh, a few of them on television. Like I, I did a couple pretty big TV shows because I learned to rap in Korean, and there oh, was yeah. like pretty much no other non-Korean to really right. do that at the okay. time. Okay, okay. Um, hmm. So I developed this unusual skill that it was first a hobby, rapping in Korean, then it kind of became something serious in terms of it allowed me to perform. I perform with Outsider, who's a really mm. big um, Korean rapper. He's actually known as. I think the sixth or seventh fastest rapper in the world, syllable for syllable, and definitely the fastest in Korea. Okay. Uh, so I performed together with him, and also I did this like this song called um, "Gukje Shijang." It's oh no, "Cheonguk uh, Nore Jarang," which basically translates to "National Singing Competition." Amazing. So I won third place in that, which is pretty sweet. It was on a, a pretty big television network, so that was awesome. And then besides that, I did some shows at some clubs and stuff like that too. And I performed on like, I did like a bit of a street performance in Hongdae, which is like the major big university area where there's a lot of street performances there okay. set up. Um, so I've done quite a variety over there. And yeah, I don't know. I, m- my experience has always been with like a Korean audience is that they're very, very like when you go on stage to perform, they're almost looking at you like they want you to do good, and they're very, very supportive. Mm. Um, especially if you're talking Korean a bit or, or also rapping in Korean. So I found them to always be really supportive and, and really dope people to perform to. I did a couple university concerts there too, um, and the crowd was always really awesome. That's amazing. That's, yeah. that's so cool to hear. You know, because um, our, our listeners you don't only know about Vancouver. Well, I was I don't want to say only know about sure. Vancouver, but love to hear the picture of. Being other places, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, so cool. it, it was it was awesome over there in general. I had such an amazing experience. Like, literally, it, it was amazing. But I I just got to a point where I was like, I have to pursue hip hop full time, and it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to be doing it in Seoul City because if it's in English, the Korean audience is not interested, and I want to. I I spent so much time becoming like 
the foreigner in Korea who was like, I got a like a little bit of of celebrity from this spicy food eating show that I did where wow. I would challenge myself to like eat some of the spiciest foods in oh, Korea. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I had a YouTube channel that was pretty successful and then I got some TV opportunities because of that too. So I got this like tiny bit, like literally every month like three people would recognize me on the street. Something like that. What? Like small, right? That's, but that's it would cool, happen. That's cool. And they'd say I'm your fan and stuff like that and it would be like, whoa, cool. Um, they, they were following my show. But I got kind of sick of just being the like, okay, I'm like the foreign guy in Korea and you know, a lot of the roles I was getting was because I was a foreigner that needed this type of certain look. And that's cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I was like, I really want to... It, it kind of took the creativity out of my life in a big way. Because how I made a living was mostly doing these commercial films where it's like dressed in a business suit, shaking some Hyundai executives. Oh, yeah. And, you know, or like <laughs> Samsung, a window to your world. And wow. I'm like there with a TV or whatever oh. um, selling <laughs> products. So it was fun and really cool. It, that stuff's actually fun to me anyways. But... I just really want, I'm like, I want to pursue music. And I just looked at like, if I want to do this full time, then, then why am I here? I started to question, why Mm -hmm. am I here? What's my goal? Do I want to be famous? Is that all I want? Am I, am I reaching for just that? Or do I want to like try to leave a meaningful impact and, and contribute something to, to music that that's going to be maybe inspire other people or, um, just people will, will enjoy listening to. So that's why I came back. Yeah, and those YouTube channels go crazy over there too. Like that's that's awesome that you were into that. Like, do you still have access to your, your channels? Yeah. So, my channel got to like eighty seven thousand subscribers, which wow. is pretty good. But, yeah. um, it, I kind of stopped posting. Mm. Like, I did one video after after I came to Vancouver, challenging these like spicy bobby wings at Wings on Granville. Okay. They're insane, by the way. Oh. So I got some of my friends together, a couple Kore- Korean friends and and a couple Canadian friends, and. We uh, we all challenged them together, and so that was cool. It got, it got quite a few views, but I always noticed my views kind of tapering off. And then I kind of tried to change. I, I have a separate channel for my hip hop stuff, which okay. is it's so pathetic comparing them. My my Korean channel's got like eighty seven thousand. My hip hop channel's got like one hundred and twenty four. That channel, like whenever I see one new subscriber, I'm like, yeah, you know, like you I get to celebrate them. I'm at one twenty five yeah. now. Wow, um, nice. So. Uh, yeah, so I tried to kind of post some of my... I tried to make it like, now it's Daybreak Korea. And, mm. You know, I tried to rebrand it and stuff like that and start posting my hip-hop stuff. But the view count was just... It was still like a few thousand per video, but it was so low compared to what it, my actual spicy food stuff was getting before. Okay. And everybody in the comments was just saying, when are you going to do spicy oh, food challenges? They, they were, were waiting. Just yeah. demanding it. So I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to do it anymore. So I just kind of gave up for, for the most part. But someday, like, my hope is that I can... Um, gain some notoriety in hip-hop in general, and then hopefully be able to maybe go back to Korea and do some shows. Right. And at that time, maybe I can film, like, a special episode of the Spicy Food Challenge, you know, as Daybreak and, and as part of, like, doing shows there or whatever. So someday I think I'll revisit it, but... I've been to the hospital a few times because of it too. It was becoming what? a health risk. Yeah, oh, I was no. doing ridiculous, ridiculous spicy food. What challenges. What happens when you when you eat too much spicy stuff? Um, just <laughs> unbelievable pain. Okay, um, okay. In the stomach that I've never ever experienced pain like that before. It happened a few times when I just went too far with it, uh, and I well, one time I had to, I, it was on a TV show and I had to be transported by ambulance oh, no. to the hospital because I was chance. like on the floor unable to move. And another time was for a TV show too when they were filming and they were like we want to do an intro about you doing a spicy food challenge and here eat this one spicy pepper I'm like if we're going to do this let's do something big I'm going to eat six spicy peppers Uh covered in this crazy spicy hot sauce sauce in a row oh my god quickly and we're going to do that and he's like no you don't have to do that this is just for the (laughs) intro I'm like no I want to (laughs) <laughs> and, oh my gosh And I ended up like literally again on the floor The director was like kind of carrying me <laughs> over his shoulder To go to the nearest hospital What? And uh, yeah I, I was just in so much pain I couldn't even I forgot my ID and wallet And they're like Can you see your ID? I'm like I, what? Just help me <laughs> Oh jeez Was this in Canada or? No in okay, Seoul okay, okay, City Okay 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 yeah. I was like oh wow Yeah that would be difficult If you don't have your ID and stuff Yeah but they, they just gave me medicine anyway Told me to, to take it And it, it worked But it was unbelievable pain For the, the time being I will say randomly, though, that the Korean medical system is so unbelievably good. It's so cheap and, wow. yeah, so effective, and you just get in right away. It's it's a really good system, actually. They take care of you nice. Yeah, yeah. That's good, that's good, that's good. Well, now, how do you balance, you know, your artistic side and, like, your your day job? What, how, do you, how do you make sure that you get all the, your, you know... 
your music out that you want? Yeah, well, I basically work full time doing retail, mm. and I don't know. I I see I see my job more as something that allows me to make music than as like a burden and something that I have to do. Like, okay. oh, I have to do this, and I. You know, so of course I want to eventually not have to do that job, but at this stage of my career, everything just kind of costs some amount of money. Right. You know, like get, totally. getting a guy to direct my music video, getting someone to edit it, um, mixing and mastering on my track. Sometimes I get lucky and like a guy like Sniker, the, the guy who did the Set Fire to a track, he's also really good at mixing and mastering. Okay. So he was able to mix and master the track as well. But um, a lot of the time I get a, a beat and then it, I, I need to get somebody to mix and master that and the vocals together. So there's that. There's all sorts of expenses that, that come up. Website fees, domain, name, yeah. hosting and all this sort oh, of man. stuff. So it's just kind of, yeah, I, I view my job as more like you know, a, a way to to fund my music career for now. Yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta do something, some kind of hustle, right? Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Oh my gosh! Well, we have some more music too. Poison Clan. Did, did you want to give that a little intro? Also? Yeah, this is a song produced by uh, a guy in Greece called Retro Beats, and it's loosely based on 1970. Eight kung fu film called The Five Deadly Venoms about five like kind of killers who each have a poison style of kung fu and uh, so I kind of tried to adapt it a little bit and that's kind of where the I just went from there when I wrote the lyrics so Poison Clan Wow here we go 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio CFRO you're listening to the Urban Renewal Project